So I want to fact check your Wikipedia page. Okay. okay. Because the explanation for why your name Smush has to do with you playing basketball and you would smush people's faces after they stole the ball and you would be that guy. I don't know. Wikipedia is wrong in that fact. Yes. Violence was the origin <laughs> that Wikipedia alleges for your name, but mm -hmm. your name is Smush because why? My mother named me Smush when I was a baby. Mm. And uh, it's a name that stuck. You know, I was introduced as a baby as Baby Smush and I grew up into just being uh, Smush. Well, the name Smush, the way it was meant by your mom, mm -hmm. um, there's a cutesy aspect to that then. The opposite of being real physical yeah. in a game. Yes, yes. It was a, 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 a term of endearment given to my dad. Mm. And, uh, you know, when I was born, I just, again, I became Baby Smush. I am actually William Henry Parker the Third, And yeah. it's the first time I've actually shared that on air, so... Yes, Kudos already finding out stuff on Pablo yes. Torre finds out that I did not know. So I love that we're starting there because I feel, and this is just a theory that I'm going to carry as a through line, I think, through this whole conversation. Okay. The way that your reputation has developed mm -hmm. has been a thing that you haven't entirely been in control of. If you went by William Henry Parker III instead of Smush Parker, I feel like your life would not have been exactly the same. Uh, I think you're right. I think I would have, I became, uh, <laughs> I don't know. What does William, William Henry Parker III sound like That's, to you? you? You sound like an executive at, like, J.P. Morgan. There you go. <laughs> I've been an executive at J.P. Morgan. Part of the reason I'm excited to talk to you is because you are f***ing honest. Mm. And you have stories from a position and a perspective in the NBA and pro sports that we very rarely get to hear from or inspect because you had an up close and personal view of the people of the egos of the business of, of the, the business yeah of the superstars the big names the hall of famers and we tell the stories typically from their point of view we're obsessed with them we cater to them the business bends around them but you're right there in these scenes, in the movie scenes. Mm -hmm. You're right there off right to the, the side, middle, yeah. in the middle, in a couple of just crazy scenarios. It's like, we just very rarely ask, what the does that guy think? <laughs> <laughs> the other guy on yeah. screen as all of this is going down. I'm not trying to save face. I'm not trying to, you know, have a persona that other people think about me. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell my truth. And whatever people, whatever opinions that people have of me, that's on them. Okay, so I just got to say that I have been obsessed with Smush Parker and his truth for years. And this is not just because he is a native New Yorker, just the latest native New Yorker to come through the Pablo Torre Finds Out Studios, but because few characters in sports history have been so minor as the annals of the NBA are concerned, and yet so major. Because Smush Parker, if you did not know, is most infamous for his extremely public beef with the late Kobe Bryant, the consummate winner, the consummate champion, who would do stuff like, you know, score 81 points in a single game. And the answer to the trivia question, who was the second leading scorer of that game is... I have no Smush idea. Smush Parker. <laughs> oh, that's so good. So we had four? He had yeah. He had thirteen. He had thirteen. But it it was something that if you were watching it, it just kept building. Uh, now you know why I had to score eighty one. <laughs> Tough days, man. Listen to that applause as Kobe is wrenching his face to great comedic effect and smushing smush. It's the sound of people adoring one of the most popular players of all time, a guy who is still a role model today across the world. And also somebody who once called Smush Parker, quote, the worst. And so... That's all people really remember about Smush, that he's synonymous with being a scrub, which I think is a shame. Because as we will find out together on today's show, Smush Parker has lived a fascinating life, and he's also embarked on a new career path, 
that is both shocking and funny to anyone who has ever met William Henry Parker III. I want to get to where you came from because okay. you're a New Yorker. And I want to bring on local characters, okay. <laughs> New Yorkers. Um, and not far from here, correct me if I'm wrong, is the place where you became yes, sir. the Smush, Smush Parker. Parker. Correct. West 4th. Yep. Explain the cage for people who are not familiar. Well, I was born in 81, so I'm an 80s baby. My dad played basketball there. My mom played basketball. And, uh, you know, back in the 80s, it was my crib growing up. During that era, you know, basketball and just the world in general, you know, we operated in community. The guys who was waiting for next would take care of me. You know, they would watch over Babysitters. Yeah, they became babysitters. They would watch over me, baby smush. So when I literally say that that was my crib growing up, I don't mean my house. It was my crib, like my, my where I crawled around and I got dirty and I was playing in the playgrounds by myself. And those guys became my uncles and they just nurtured me. Yeah, and, and West 4th Street, the cage, I mean, to be very, very clear about this for non-New Yorkers, mm -hmm. this is a world-famous basketball world court. World-famous basketball court. And it's the sort of court where, imagine a movie, and you might imagine something like the cage, insofar as there are 20-foot-high chain-link fences mm -hmm. all around. There's a three-point line, but if you might, yo, if you shoot a corner three, <laughs> you might be fading away into that fence. Corner three? There is no corner three. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as a corner three at West 4th Street. That's right. Well, they call it the cage. So it's like you're playing inside of the zoo. I like to kick it. This is the number one street ball court. Like, this is where basketball is at its purest. The guys that play here are very aggressive. So no one gives you an inch. To get an inch, you got to take it. It's the epicenter of competitiveness. Everybody out there is ready to compete. You have the best of the Bronx, the best of Queens, the best of Manhattan, the best of Brooklyn, the best of Staten Island, all congregating at this one small little, what is it, you know, 25 by 15. So, so small. But the best of each borough, that's the court that they play in because that's where the best of New York City went to showcase their skills. Something that makes me laugh whenever I just watch Pickup, walking by a court and being like, yo, that guy's wearing jeans. Mm. <laughs> that guy's wearing black Air Force yeah. Ones. Yeah. Yo, like, what does that say yeah. about him, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, you don't know who's going to be there. Not at all. People just getting off of work. Their construction jobs, their nine-to-five corporate jobs, and they have their basketball gear in the back of the car. There was one guy who never not played basketball pickup without his Tims on. <laughs> he played pickup in Tim's. That's crazy. That that is that is a New York legend at this point. Oh my! The he idea a that legend. a guy would play in, he in Tim's. Played in Timberlands. <laughs> Based on that fact alone, I just know that I don't want to be fouled by that guy. No, not at all. That guy was tough, tough as nails. <laughs> Literally, was working with nails during yes, the day. Exactly. <laughs> So, so you bring all of this accumulated toughness from having mm -hmm. encountered all of these people yeah. in this crazy ecosystem of, of streetball. And when you're there starting organized basketball, when do you get a sense of like, I might be an NBA player. I might make this an actual job. So I never not believed that I was making it to the NBA. Like there wasn't ever a doubt. So when I, when, I, when I saw, when I watched Michael Jordan growing up, and again, I, this was back in the 80s, early 90s, and I, I was watching Mike destroy the Knicks. Yeah, of course. <laughs> several times. Over and over again. Over and over and over again. And I was like, I aspired to be just like Mike. I wanted to be like Mike. Just like those Gatorade commercials back in the day. Like Mike. If I could be like Mike. And I had a mindset of that's what I want to do when I grow up. Well, there's a funny thing about New York guards, right? Mm -hmm. The knock on, like, the New York guard was these guys can't shoot. They can't shoot. Why is that? Because of how we play basketball. What, the, what, was, the mo what was the most played game back in the 80s and 90s in, in streetball? Oh, like 21? Exactly. Everybody for themselves melee. One against everybody else. Yeah, let's just say, everyone versus the world. Let's just say there wasn't enough to run a full, so let's just leave the number at nine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine guys in a, in, a, in a park wanting to play competitive basketball, didn't have enough to run full. So we played uh, 21. 
and you had to go up against non-players. So naturally, instinctively, we had to create ways of scoring against multiple defenders. In traffic. In traffic. So you dri- you learn how to dribble. No, I hadn't thought about this, but you you're totally how to right. And be a playmaker, and that's what we did in the '80s and '90s. We learned how to dribble the basketball. So naturally, we we weren't in the gym or outside shooting jump shots. We were learning how to create off the dribble. Yes, and that's the strongest part of a New York City point guard or basketball player's game is being able to create off the dribble. Okay, so I want to fast forward some here because you need to just explain what it's like to have a draft party where you do not get drafted. The disappointment was at the highest of my life at that point. Uh, embarrassment. A little confused because uh, I I was given word that I would uh, be drafted as high as seven. Mm. I won't say the team. <laughs> I won't tell you the team <laughs> who promised Ooh. that I would be drafted at seven, and uh, that wasn't the case. So at the time in Times Square, there was a place called ESPN Zone. It was a sports bar. Yeah, that is maybe the saddest place to hold a draft party where you go undrafted. A temple to sports, mm-hmm. and you're living a nightmare. Yeah. The good news is that you're incredibly resilient. <laughs> I mean, the the story of your NBA life, which we're now into, is remarkable mm-hmm. because you're a guy who had almost zero job security. Basketball here in America is a business. No doubt. You know, not a lot of people know that. More and more every day. I learned that late. I learned that when I was 36 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I learned at 36 years old that basketball here in America is a business. So when I didn't get drafted, I was like, you know what? I'm good enough. There's nothing that's going to stop me from making an NBA. Let me get back to work. I went back to work. I earned a spot, a walk-on spot on the Cleveland Cavaliers, non-guaranteed contract. Yep. Every day I came in with that worker's mentality, that blue-collar mentality that I need to work and earn my spot on this team uh, because at any point they could let me go. And it's not just any rookie season. It's not just any season, right? This is 2000-2003. This is the year before LeBron James gets drafted. Mm-hmm. And so one of my favorite videos... Oh, my God. Are you talking about the, all the other players? Yeah, who, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I say other players who hated on this high school player coming in to the organization. I get lumped into that. It's a local news report in Cleveland. Yes, yeah. And you remember this vividly. Yes, it's all of you guys getting interviewed. Carlos Boozer, Darius yeah, Miles. Yeah. Um, because the team is... is of course, on track to get the number one draft pick. Yes, LeBron and, James. And, and here is... I know what you I know, said. You know, but the listeners don't. Is the 18-year-old from Akron truly the savior? We have better players than him in his position already on our team, bro. Um, his potential is probably the sky's the limit for him, bro. And he would come in and make an immediate impact like a Karan Butler, you know, did for the Miami Heat. I don't think you can really just bring a high school player in and really just think your team going to really turn around like that. What people um, were laughing at was, of course, everybody being like, this LeBron James kid, when he shows up, he can join our bandwagon. Um, but yeah, you compared him to Karan Butler, which in your mind, you're saying for, for clarity, at was that, a, was a yeah, compliment. Yeah, at that time... That's all. That's you know, Karan Butler when he became when he a rookie for um, Miami Heat. Yeah, the UConn. came in and made an immediate impact and was averaging double figures at that time as a rookie. And I was like, yeah, he, he this kid will come in and make an immediate impact like a Karan Butler did for the Miami Heat. I didn't just limit no. him to a Karan Butler. You look by far the least crazy out of everybody in that video. But do you know I still get. People almost every day who say I was, yo, I hated on LeBron. I actually got tagged on LeBron's page saying that <laughs> these are my haters. So this is what I love about your life in basketball is that you're kind of like this Forrest Gump character mm-hmm. who winds up in places and you're dealing with all of the consequences of yeah. like what it means to be in the future shadow of LeBron James. Mm-hmm. 
So we should go then to your time in Detroit. That's what happens next. You join the defending champion Detroit Pistons. Yes. Larry Brown is the coach. Which was a great uh, cast of guys. Great cast of guys. Yes. Rasheed Wallace. Yes. Chauncey Billups. Yes. Um, ben Wallace. Ben Wallace, Tayshon of course. Prince, Tayshon Hamilton, Prince. Derek Coleman, Lindsey Hunter, Darwin Ham. It was a, a team full of veterans. And here you are, like, again, young point guard mm -hmm. who is now on his second team in two years yes. in the NBA. Yes. And... There's a game at the Palace at Auburn Hills. Yes. Um, and you might remember it. I remember it vividly. <laughs> because this happens. The Malice of the Palace. <laughs> ben Wallace, baseline, inbounding the ball to Smush Parker. To Smush Parker, yeah. I'm the one with the ball right now. And this is the part that I love because no one plays this video from like 15 seconds before oh, yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Setting up the action. Pass to Rip Hamilton, down to Ben Wallace. Oh. There, there's the Ron Artest hard foul. And while the malice of the palace is beginning, yeah. I just want to point out where you are. Yeah, I'm just watching, taking it all in. <laughs> and just for people who can't see this on the DraftKings Network or on YouTube, everybody else is in the scrum, and you are literally the like, you're calm, you're observing everything. What is going through your mind as you were standing, what, like 10 feet as the most infamous, notorious brawl in sports history is happening? You want to really know what was going through my, my mind at that time? So I was playing for the returning champs, Detroit yes. Pistons, who was being led by the great Chauncey Billups. So you can imagine I wasn't getting no playing time. Yeah. And you can see here it's the fourth quarter. Yeah, it's I like less than a minute left. Yeah, I probably just got in. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm like, yo, I'm on the floor. I'm excited. And then this breaks out. And I'm standing there like, yo, I just want to play basketball. What's going on? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to get a sweat. So just to be very clear about this, your perspective as the malice at the palace is unfolding is... I was about to do something yes. with this basketball, yeah, and exactly. everything got in the way. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was like, damn it, guys, can we just play? I'm trying to dunk on somebody. I only have so many minutes that I'm going to have yep. as, a, as a Detroit Piston. To and, earn my minutes, exactly. And everybody decided to start fighting. Now our test has jumped over the scorer's table and is trying to get down to the bench. Oh, this is awful. Fans are getting involved. Jermaine O'Neal is punching a guy in the face. Steven yep. Jackson's running around. You see Steven Jackson in there taking shot at the stands. And Swish Parker is where? Half court, watching it all, because half court is the safest place to be. <laughs> <laughs> I just like how the guy who grew up playing street ball in the cage mm. gets to professional basketball and is like, you guys are out of control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're the guy. I'm like, I, I'm not getting involved in this. I had no job security. Maybe if I had a five-year contract, and I could... I could you know, afford to get suspended. I might have been in the middle of that. <laughs> I might have been that's in the a, middle. That's a great point. So, okay, so you go from there, you go to Phoenix, and again, you just happen to wind up on the seven seconds or less Phoenix Suns mm -hmm. as Steve Nash's backup. Mm -hmm. Steve Nash, he's in the midst of an MVP, yep. and you're on a 10-day. So I, I, I wasn't getting any playing time again. <laughs> <laughs> But I was in practice, you know, working hard, you know, trying to, you know, let these guys know that I belong here. And I'm excited to be here, but I wasn't getting no playing time. Yeah, this makes sense to me. What makes less sense is how you end up being the starting point guard of the Los Angeles Lakers the next season. <laughs> no, it, it makes perfect sense when I explain it to you like this. When I was in Detroit, who was I playing behind? Chauncey Billups. When I was in Phoenix, who was I playing behind? Steve Nash. When I got to L.A., who was there? I don't even remember. Exactly. <laughs> So think about Seriously, it. Seriously, who was there? Yeah. I don't remember. They brought in Aaron McKee from the Philadelphia 76ers, 76ers. to be their starting point guard. Because remember, Phil Jackson liked big guards, and he was a 6'5 right. point guard. That's right. Who could come down and run the triangle offense. Yep. Um, he was the big name. Man. They gave, him, they gave him all that money to come there to be the starting point guard. That's right. And I was a hungry smush in Detroit, but getting no minutes behind Chauncey Billups. I was a hungry smush behind Steve Nash and Phoenix. Those guys deserved the playing time. I got it. I was learning while I was there. When I got to L.A., it was just Aaron McKee. <laughs> not to, and not to say he wasn't a good player. But at this but point in his career, 
he was on he was on his yes he you're, was you're, old. you're you're sensing this Older. could be this could be my job yes and I and I went in. I, listen, I went in there with the same mentality I went in with in Detroit and Cleveland and Phoenix. I'm gonna work to earn my spot. So Phil Jackson is the coach. Yes. Phil Kobe Jackson. Bryant is a superstar, of yes. course. How do you learn that Smush Parker? is now going to be the starting point guard of the most marquee franchise in the NBA. So they never told me I was going to be the starting point guard. I just showed up every day and I wasn't fired. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, I, you know, I went there to training camp. I, you know, fought and clawed my way through training camp, earned my way on a uh, non-guaranteed contract again. Yep. Two years this time. I guess I played better than most. Sure. Matter of fact, you know, I'll be, I'll, I won't be humble now. I did play better than most in the preseason. And when the start of the season came, I was still on the team. I didn't get fired, so I showed up the next day. First game of the season, you know, Phil Jackson walks into the locker room maybe 10 minutes before the game, says, Smush, you're starting tonight, and walks out of the locker room. And that's, and that's how I found out I was starting. <laughs> that was it. That was the first time. I, I didn't start in the preseason. I didn't start in training camp. I was never on a, the first team on any in, in the practice squad. So just for context here, okay, so Phil Jackson, of course, mm -hmm. one of yeah. the greatest coaches of all time, the Zen master, yes. Hall of Famer, master motivator. Mm -hmm. What was your relationship like with him before then? Never had a conversation with him. We had training camp in Hawaii. And for, I want to say, training camp is about a month and a half. I was everything but smush. He never called me smush. He always called me smack, smooch, smuck, everything, <laughs> everything but smush. Hey, smack, get back on defense. Hey, smack, run the triangle. Smooch, <laughs> everything but smush. And uh, it was just hazing. I guess right. I, need to, I need to earn his respect like everybody else. Testing you. Yes, yes. For people who don't know NBA history, this is after Shaquille O'Neal has gone. Mm-hmm. This is Kobe Bryant in I'm about to win MVP mode. Mm -hmm. This is Kobe Bryant without Shaq um, going on to, I mean, that first year, man, he averaged 35 a game, mm -hmm. 41 minutes a night um, for Phil Jackson. This is before Pau Gasol gets there. Yep. And so my understanding of your time in LA, of course, really only clicked in after you were gone. Because this is, and you know, when you Google Smush Parker, mm -hmm. what comes up 99% of the time? The feud I have with Kobe, unfortunately. But it's an incredibly rich text that I want to sort of like unpack with you because mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's been presented in a way that totally makes sense. It doesn't. Because the way that it comes into the public view, this is in October 2012, this is years after you're out of L.A. Mm -hmm. And he says a quote that I'm sure I've heard. You, yep. you, you are uh, unfortunately being reminded of by me, the millionth person. He says this. He's talking to Steve Nash, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay? He, this is him telling the story. I tell Steve, you won MVP, but I was playing with Smush Parker. He's playing with Leandro Barbosa. I'm playing with Smush and Kwame Brown. My goodness, Smush Parker was the worst. He shouldn't have been in the NBA, but we were too cheap to pay for a point guard. We let him walk on. And that's the quote. And when he says it, of course, there's like, ha, 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 it's funny. Like, he's, you know, whatever, talking trash on, like, his old teammates. Like, that's amusing to people. But at the same time, it was like, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. What is your understanding of what sparked his comment seemingly out of nowhere? So that spark has been there for years. You know, it was, uh, you know, something that, uh, a snowball that I created. I did a small, like, little interview outside of West 4th Street. At the cage? At the cage. You know, somebody was holding a recorder and a little little camera. And uh, this was, I want to say, the summer of 2007, my years after L.A. Mm. And they asked me about, you know, my time in the NBA, my time as a Laker, my time playing with Kobe Bryant. And when I got to answering about my time with Kobe Bryant, as normal, I answered it honestly. My truth, you know, what my experiences were. And I said it was an overrated experience. 
Playing with Kobe. Playing with Kobe Bryant. And now everybody who's who's a fan of Kobe's, including the interviewer, was like, hmm, explain, what do you mean by overrated experience? And because I have inside information, because I dealt with this man for two seasons and my, my locker was here, his locker was here for right two next seasons. To him. Like, I watched this man put on his shoes every day for work. <laughs> right. He watched me put on my shoes every day for work. Starting backcourt yeah. together, you two. Yeah. So I was speaking from my experience. It was overrated because the man never spoke to me. Mm. I wasn't the 12th man on the bench. I wasn't the, the call up from the G League who was trying to just uh, fill a, a roster spot. I started with this man. I was his coworker. Like we shared a cubicle. Side by side. How do you do that for two seasons and never hold a conversation? Never, what's up? Good morning. You know, do you need anything? Can, can I get you a cup of coffee? You know, how's the family? Nothing. Two seasons, side by side. Yeah. And that's what I said. My next comments hurt his feelings, and therefore he had to retaliate. So what did you say next? I shared a story about how I did try to talk to him. You know, I'm like, I'm the starting point guard with him in the backcourt. Let me just try to talk to him. And I, you know, said, did you catch, happen to catch the football game last night? And he looked at me, honestly, looked at me and said, you can't talk to me. You need more accolades under your belt before you come talk to me. And he was dead serious. Mm. I'm not even going to get to, you know, how that's disrespectful as a man, man to man, just Self-evident. Saying, yeah. Um, so that set the tone, never spoke to him for, again or tried to for two years as a starting point guard. And by the way, like, you had your best years. In L.A. In L.A. Yes. yes. Right? Like, it's not. And, <sighs> and, any, and anybody who watches those Laker years saw that we worked well together. There was a chemistry. So when I say that you had your best years, I'm not saying, yo, you got to know Smush Parker was an all-star. I'm saying that Smush Parker playing off of Kobe Bryant, mm-hmm. scoring 35 a night, was getting steals. Mm-hmm. You were moving the ball. Mm-hmm. You were running the triangle mm-hmm. as best you could with and a guy a- who didn't want to. average double-digit uh, points with going with six or seven shots per game. And to your point, right, you had some big moments. Mm-hmm. I remember you jammed it on Andre Miller at one point. Yes. Good job. Lakers have the numbers. So three on two. Smush with the right hand. Oh. Smush Parker's to the rack. You had that big steal on Steve Nash mm-hmm. in that series against the Suns. They'd love to get it into Nash's hands, and they do. They do. Ball knocked away, stolen by Parker. Oh, here, it is. here comes George to Kobe Bryant. Bryant inside, it's good, it's good. Tie game. Seven tenths of a second remaining. In retrospect, it was the back and forth that carried on. No, it was it was this comment that, uh, that actually, I, I, I'm sure, set those wheels in motion. I said, the problems in, L- in L.A. end and start with Kobe Bryant. Mm. And I felt that way because as the leader, as the captain, as the star of the team, if you don't communicate with your teammates, how, how is a team supposed to be successful? And so this is where it gets to 2012, 2012 now, and Kobe is talking about how... Yeah, I, mean, I gave him his little 30 minutes of fame again. Man. You know, it's all good. How's the okay, show? I wish him the best of luck. He's playing in China right now, right? He's going over there in a couple months. Too. Wish him the best of luck, man. Maybe he'll get back to the NBA one day. I can see what it's like up close. There's the interview that he gave where he's like being asked, um, you know who was the second leading scorer when you scored 81? I have no Smush idea. Smush Parker. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so good. So, we have four. It's a jab. It's very clear. And then in 2019, he's talking about how, you know, if he's being triple teamed. Well, it depends who's on the team. If I got Smush Parker lagging yeah, behind you, me to shoot, yeah, you'll shoot you best time. believe I'm shooting that yeah. motherfucker <laughs> shot. If I got D Fish back there, I'm kicking that shit back. <laughs> 100%. Still. And I'm just like, and so the thing about your name. It almost was a verb for what he was trying to do to you. He was, like, trying to smush you like a bug. Mm-hmm. And it became this joke. And it became a joke that everybody used. But if you check the numbers, just check the numbers. I was the third leader scorer that team, third in scorer behind him and Lamar Odom, which I should have been as a walk-on player. What does it mean to be the other guy in the picture? Mm-hmm. 
the other guy without the job security, the other guy who's scrapping for everything, the other guy who is trying to prove himself at a point at which um, he's encountering what one of the greatest superstars of all time um, considers uh, to be leadership, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is, I I think even Kobe later on, not ever specifically addressing you, right? Because he never likes anything about you that was positive on the record. But what he did say, I think referring to this time was like, that wasn't him at his best as a leader. People didn't realize, you know, the, the, the teammate that Kobe really was. You know, one thing that Kobe was a master of was putting on a face for, you know, the world to see. Yes, as, and as I, and the I, and ultimate... I, and I don't want to... I'm not talking about... I'm not talking negative, negatively about the deceased. Of course. And I think something I want to make clear here, too, is that, like, at a certain point, when you are a historical figure, mm-hmm. like Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan or Will Chamberlain or yeah. Kareem or whoever it is, right? Like, I believe that we should talk honestly because we look to those people as role models. Mm-hmm. And so when someone is like, this is what it was like behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. I actually think it's important for us to not mythologize beyond what is deserved, even as we are diplomatic and respectful. And and again, I'm not taking away from the player Kobe was. No, no, no. Indisputably an all-time great. Yeah, he's one of the greatest. No question. Like one of the most decorated athletes to ever play this game. I was I was there. I mean, this is you just rarely hear someone be like, it was overrated because and fill in all of the blanks in a way that'll make people like be like, no, you're wrong. I don't believe you. People don't believe you, Smush. Mm-hmm. They don't. As players who play with them, we we have our own conversations and our own stories, and we share. The same experiences, but when we get on this right here, yeah, yeah, yeah. when we get in front of the cameras, they say something different, or they don't speak on it at all. Right. Like I was, uh, I've, I've been the only one, literally the, the only, only person only one. who's been brave enough. And this is, of course, before he passed, and then after he passed. And I just want to be very, again, I want to be sensitive to this insofar as the tributes, the love. I am not saying do not feel that way if that was your favorite player and he was, of course, a tremendous player. Yeah, of course. Did you ever try to reach out to Kobe Bryant? I did try to reach out to Kobe Bryant. It was after the uh, the 2012 comments, but before everything else, like, you know, 2019. Oh, oh, so this is like in the middle of it. I uh, started to attend uh, this church led by Pastor Louis Stryker Jr. And he's the hugest Laker fan. (laughs) <laughs> Hugest Laker fan. Uh, Which means he's a Kobe fan. I thought it might be a cool thing to do to reach out to Kobe to see if I get him to sign a basketball and maybe a picture to give, to present to my pastor for Christmas. Mm. So I wrote Kobe a letter, and I don't remember yeah, what Yeah, yeah, paraphrasing, but, yeah. Yeah, paraphrasing. But what I do remember saying was, um, young mind, young thoughts, young words. You know, And I said, I'm sorry for what I, you know, said in the past. and. Mm. The letter went unanswered. I didn't get a response back from Kobe, but he did sign the basketball. He did sign the picture. Well, what happened from there was he continued to talk. Yeah, about exactly. You. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so for you, I mean, from there, right? Like, it's it's just crazy where you go next. Mm-hmm. Because you end up playing with the Miami Heat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the way you get that job... Mm-hmm. It's nuts. ...is incredible. Yes. How do you get this job with the Miami Heat? Uh, so you want to talk about polar opposites. Um, I'm hanging out in New York. I'm watching the Roy Jones fight at 40-40 um, by myself. And who comes strolling in 40-40 by himself also is Shaquille O'Neal. Naturally. So we end up in the same VIP suite, you know, just watching the fight. It's just me and him. And we are sharing Laker Kobe moments. <laughs> <laughs> now that is a TV show. I mean, yeah. just you and Shaq reminiscing yeah. about what it was like. Yeah, bonding, just bonding. Just you know, he's a real, he's the coolest guy you'll ever meet. By the way, and, total and, opposite, and, and had his own, of course, very famous yeah incident. enmity. Yeah, you couldn't do without me, Kobe. You can't do without me. Kobe, you can't do it without me. Everybody, Kobe, tell me how my ass tastes. Yeah, you can't do it without me. And then later yeah. reconciliation with Kobe. Yeah. 
favorite moment that we ever had was on the bus leaving the arena, leaving Arco Arena, what we do. When we got there, people were, were mooning us. Uh-huh. So after the game, all of us put our ass on the window, and we mooned them. And the guy was like, and the guy was just like, Thank God they didn't have camera yeah. phones back yeah. then. Yeah, I know, right? It would, it would have been all yeah. bad. I remember that. That was, my favorite, that was my favorite moment, man. And, you know, I'm a free agent at this point, so he asked me where I was playing at next, and I said, you know, I'm a free agent, you know, still shopping around. And, you know, he makes a phone call. Long story short, the very next day, the very next day, my agent had a two-year contract with the Miami Heat. <laughs> guaranteed this time. <laughs> my first guaranteed contract out of the six-year career that I had in the NBA before I decided to leave. Well, hold on. Hold on. So why did you decide to leave the NBA? It was just stealing the love and the joy from me out of the game, the game that I love so much that I grew up playing. I love basketball. Love playing basketball. It was fun. Yes. I was good at it. I knew I was good at it. I proved that I was good at it. That part of, of the game for me at that level just became unfun. So I decided to, you know, leave the NBA and go travel the world. So when you say travel the world, mm -hmm. you mean this quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> Give me literally. the list of countries that Smush Parker played in. Two seasons, two years in Greece, won a championship in Greece, played two years in China, won two championships in China. Played in Russia, Croatia, Lebanon, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Mongolia, <laughs> Tunisia, and Morocco. That's Carmen San Diego, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, Where exactly. in the world is Smush Parker? Exactly. And the treatment that you experienced abroad oh, versus man. what it was like in the NBA was was how oh, different. Man. I was the Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan <laughs> on the teams that I played on. Part of the movie of your life, and mm -hmm. I believe it is a movie, by the way, is you go from being the other, other guy in these photos, in yeah. this game film, in this viral clip, mm -hmm. to now being a guy who is treated as the center of attention. Mm -hmm. And that must have just felt incredibly, profoundly um, fulfilling after being deprived of that. I was never in the game of basketball to be notarized or to be held up on a pedestal. I just wanted to play basketball. And I was able to do that overseas. It wasn't worry of I'm not going to be here tomorrow or I have a non-guaranteed contract or I could be released or this guy is, you know, he, he's making $15 million a year, but he can't hold my gym shocks, so he's getting a playing time because he's being paid this. None of that. Yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. basketball. And that's what I loved about playing overseas. It's funny, right? Like, in the world of NBA fandom, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, you played overseas, you're a scrub. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go to the world of real life, and it's like, I have three passports mm -hmm. because I traveled the world being paid to play basketball. Talk about it. In some of the most beautiful countries on the planet. Yes, sir. Is literally yeah. a dream. Yes. I have a world of experience and worldly knowledge that I wouldn't have gotten if I just stayed here playing basketball here in the States. And that's and that, too, is the beauty of basketball. Yes, sir. It's a global game. You actually got to feel like what it's like to, to win a championship in Greece, do in you know, China. <laughs> <laughs> do you know that in Greece, when we won this championship, they literally, like, turned the city upside down? And as far as the eye can see, it was just fans in the street. And I'm up there holding the trophy, and, like, I can hear the chants from 30, 30 stories up. It was a incredible uh, feeling. What I imagine must be frustrating at the center of this, as you have been portrayed by all of these people now collectively following Kobe's lead, is that you just didn't love the game. You didn't want it bad enough, right? Like that, this part, the mama mentality idea is I want it more than everybody. I'm the hardest worker. I love the game. You don't get on my level or mm -hmm. go f yourself. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing now, <laughs> what you're trying to do now is maybe the most undeniable way to express how much you love basketball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. Smush Parker today is trying to do what? Become an NBA official. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh a laugh of just like, this movie is crazy. 
right? Because mm-hmm. um, how do you get the idea to be a ref? It was a seed planted back when I was 13. Um, every Saturday morning, I would wake up 5.30 a.m. religiously to get to the gym by 8. And the guy who ran the gym, he was like, listen, you're here every day. You know how to play basketball. Do you want to ref these eight, nine-year-old youth games for $15, $20 a game? So that's where the seed was planted. Didn't know, didn't have any dreams of being a referee when I grew up. That's just what I did. That was my first job. And so when does the thought enter your mind as an adult, I want to do that? You know, going into my mid-30s, you know, yeah. my body's not reacting the same way. It's not healing as fast. You know, I'm traveling the world, but now I want to be more, you know, at home, you know, here in, in the States. So I'm thinking, what can I do with life after playing basketball? Mm. What am I going to do for the next 40 years of my life? I think I was watching an uh, NBA game. <laughs> And I'm like, yo, that was a terrible call. And then a light bulb goes off. Bing! (laughs) And I'm like, I should become a referee. And so when the light bulb goes off, do you know how many players had, NBA players had attempted this before? No. You didn't know any of that? I didn't know any of that, no. Because the list is short. Very short. (laughs) Extremely short. Haywood Workman. Mm Mm-hmm. Bernie Fryer. Mm Mm-hmm. Leon Wood. Yeah. And you're trying to be number four. I'm trying to be number four. Have you talked to those guys? Because the the, the transition uh-huh. from player to ref is, I hope, self evidently, like uh, fascinating mm-hmm. and and crazy yeah. in a way. Yeah, to be on both sides of that aisle. Yeah. I actually have Haywood Workman's number on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, he he's devoted himself in helping me in this process. But the back room structure of like how to become one of those guys with a whistle we're talking about 70 to 80 full-time nba refs yes. there are 450 to 500 roster spots for players mm-hmm. so the math the statistics actually harder to be an nba ref. i've said that i said it might be harder for me to make the nba as a referee than it was as a player so you're trying to do you're trying to shoot the moon twice i'm trying to do the impossible twice but to be a ref like, there are, what, tests? There is, there are, like, there's a ladder. There's the equivalent of, like, a hierarchy you got to climb up. Yes, uh, that ladder is very vast. That information that you need to know is very vast. And what a, people, a lot of people don't know is the rules are different. Yeah. Which is shocking to even me. <laughs> Why are, is high school rules different than college rules and college rules different than NBA rules when it's all the same game? Doesn't make sense to me, but... But now you got to learn all of it. Yeah. Even the, down to the mechanics, the way you make calls are different on each level. So when you say a lot. when you say the mechanics, yes. you mean like actually how you raise your arm? Yeah. They want us to, it's very structured. They want us to look a certain way. When I watch the game, I'm like, oh, a ref is going to call something in the first quarter mm-hmm. differently than they would in the last minute. And so there's like an art to how to control a game. So there's a thing that they call at the pro level advantage, disadvantage. Let's just get this on on air right now. Because everybody thinks that contact is a foul. People think that basketball is a non-contact sport and that if there's contact, it's an automatic foul. No. Basketball is a contact sport. There's legal contact and then there's illegal contact. But not all contact means it's a foul. Let's just address that part. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's just address that. I love that ref smush has finally gotten <laughs> into just, the building. Let's just yeah, address yeah, that. Yeah, you yeah. know, now we take that illegal contact and we add advantage, disadvantage. So if you're strong enough to play through certain contact that didn't uh, affect you, we let it go at that NBA level. So what is, in terms of the thing that opened your eyes the most, in mm-hmm. terms of like, oh, I, as a player, had this totally wrong. Mm-hmm. What's the thing that you now appreciate that you didn't before? The entire game. I didn't know. Uh, the entire game of basketball. <laughs> You're shaking your head ruefully. The, the entire game of basketball has, has changed in my eyes. I knew how to play basketball. Did I know the rules? Not at all. Mm. Nobody outside of the referees knows the rules of basketball. No, it seems simple. It, it, it seems simple. There's a, there's a level of this game that I didn't know. And I'm almost ashamed that I actually spoke 
mm. to referees when I played. <laughs> I am no, for I am ashamed. And when people, when players talk to me now as a referee, yeah. I just laugh. <laughs> I chuckle because they are just as ignorant as I was. If they knew what we know as referees, they would they would approach the game of basketball differently. I love I I, I genuinely love that you use we now. Because you're a ref. Mm-hmm. And I want to know what your colleagues, as when you were a player, mm-hmm. if, what do they, what do they think about you crossing to the other side? They they laugh at me. They <laughs> laugh because they know I know what kind of person I was. Put it this way: I used to show up to tournaments and put my tech money on the table. <laughs> I'm I'm getting a tech you, this game. You you were the problem. I was the one who I I challenged the referees to show up. Amazing. That's what I did. If I if I was going to be on my best game, I want you to be on your best game too. So I'm going to put my first tech money up right now because I already know that you you're, you're going to be falling asleep. <laughs> that these are, these guys are out here just for a hobby and a paycheck and some extra and they're not taking this game seriously. They're walking yeah. up and down the court. No, 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 no. If I'm putting my best foot forward, you have to put your best foot forward. I'm going to call you out on, you know, not seeing a foul call. I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to, you know, say some things to wake you up, but not disrespectfully. Of course, you would go from that guy to yeah to 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 hopefully the fourth player exactly. to ever become a ref. God has, <laughs> I, I say it all the time, God has a sense of humor. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. I say it to myself all day, every day. Like, here I am, a referee. I just really can't believe... I'm a referee. <laughs> I really can't believe it. Right, right. Um, William Henry Parker III, thank you for, for being smush. Thank you, PT. I appreciate you for having me. No, thank you for uh, for being around your old neighborhood a yes, little sir. bit. This has been Pablo Torre Finds Out, a Meadowlark Media production. And I'll talk to you next time.